this is the final program in the eighth series of Checkerboard. It sounds like a test match result, and that's just what it's felt like at times, a test match. And in keeping with the cricket simile, we've just scored a century. That was 1974, and like a number of filmmakers in Australia, my career started on the ABC's groundbreaking Checkerboard series. And depending on how you've got on with your examination, the programs were in-depth human interest stories, the likes of which had never been seen before on Australian television. People from all walks of life were given a chance to tell their own stories. It's enormous! I often wondered what happened to those we filmed. To find out, I looked back into the archives. In the five years since Checkerboard started, there's been a remarkable change in social attitudes. For instance, we've made 100 programs, but shown only 99. There was the program that didn't make it to air. We may come into the world naked, but we soon learn to cover up. Social mores were such that when we made a program about nudists, it couldn't be shown. Now, just four years later, it wouldn't raise an eyebrow. Wasn't that naughty? Nudists, nuns, dwarfs, and derelicts. They're all part of our society. In many ways, until the advent of checkerboard, a lot of subjects were like breaking wind. We all do it, but one doesn't talk about it. In fact, this attitude of ours led us to being accused of being too prying, sensational, scandal mongers, ruthless. In short, some people thought we weren't very nice. What we did was a serious exercise in television. We didn't peep through a keyhole at Poofters. We tried to show what it meant to be a homosexual. Bonsall and Peter share a house in an inner city suburb of Sydney. They resist the assumption that their relationship mirrors a heterosexual one. Neither assumes the female role. It's an equal partnership. Neither is greatly artistic, and in truth, they are only remarkable in that they were prepared publicly to talk about their homosexuality. But homosexual practice is a crime in our society. Many people react to it with great repugnance. Good, fine. I'll put a couple more in. All right. Is the physical expression of your love for each other confined entirely to a sexual relationship, or do you get the sort of pleasure that other people get out of just being affectionate towards each other? I think it's, it's made more difficult in our case, for instance, for us to walk hand in hand through the city. Uh, would be fairly, fairly difficult and restrictive. Uh, when we say goodbye, when we go to work on the street, uh, it would be fairly difficult to give each other a, a goodbye kiss. Uh, so, such restrictions make our lives fairly difficult, I would think. But it's taken some practice to make this natural. It was a very conscious act at first, and to our surprise, we found that nobody takes the slightest bit of notice. <laughs> and uh, we're pleased about this, and now we're able to do it naturally. But it was a big jump to get to that stage of being able to do it. Thirty years later, Bon and Peter still share their Sydney home. A lot has changed since then, but the memory of being on checkerboard was so strong, they named their house after it. Shall I get some wine and you get the biscuits? Mm. Okay. okay. I can remember thinking then that uh, I was being given the opportunity to come out on national television and that that was going to save me ever having to come out as a gay person ever again and of course I've found we both found that it's been very very different from that we still find that uh, at work perhaps we have to come out perhaps every day and of course coming out has always been a you know, a very important part, I think, of most uh, lesbians and gays uh, in order to achieve the kind of things we have achieved. And I think it is 
very largely due to people coming out and being up front and saying, well, no, I'm not married, I'm not heterosexual, but I do have somebody in my life who's important. Speak, Yeah, I'll speak, Good. In 1972, the fight for gay rights in Australia was on the increase, with activist groups burgeoning around the country. Peter and Bon were founding members of the organisation called Campaign Against Moral Persecution, known as CAMP. One of the phrases that CAMP members use a lot is this phrase, coming out. What does it actually mean? Uh, it, uh, it really means having the courage and it does take courage at this stage to um, actually be able to tell other people that you're homosexual without having anything to shout about necessarily I and mean, there's nothing whatsoever different about me simply because I'm homosexual this just happens to be a part of me but uh, beforehand, uh, before I sort of had the added strength of the membership of camp with me, as it were, um, I used to hide this part of me that, uh, that is a definite part. Coming out is up to the individual. I wouldn't like to pressure anybody into, uh, into coming out. It's you know, whenever a person is ready to, to make that step, he will, he will do so. Uh, about a year, 18 months ago, I wouldn't have sat here and been filmed, you know, coming out. It's just a, a slow process of living easier. I think we were very naive, in a sense, but more so, I think we were so committed to uh, liberation of, of uh, homosexual people, as we were called then, which is a bit different now, more lesbians and gays. And I think the commitment sort of overruled everything else. But yes, I think there was, you know, there was some naivety there, because if we look back, the kind of attitudes that were around at the time, uh, we should have, with hindsight, foreseen what might have happened. Bon worked as a church secretary in a conservative Anglican parish on Sydney's North Shore. Just 10 days after he and Peter appeared on the checkerboard program, Bon was sacked. The outraged gay community went into bat for him and the press had a field day. Why do you think that this has caused such a storm in Mossman? I think it's a theological matter, basically, for the people there who are worried that uh, I have said that I'm a homosexual uh, they consider that this is sinful and uh, therefore that the church has no place for someone of my ilk you don't think then that's just prejudice on the part of the Mossman people Do you think it's theological I think it must be I can't understand a prejudice against uh, me myself uh, I don't think it could be there because I've worked there happily for four years. Particularly Bond got a lot of media exposure just after his, uh, his second from the church. And we had lots and lots of people calling, of course, uh, by telephone. And they used to call any time during the day and at night and we started to realize that it was important to try and develop some kind of telephone service which which was then established and in fact in the house here in the front room downstairs that's that was the very beginning of what now is the gay and lesbian counseling service which was then called phone a friend i think phone a friend was here for about 12 months or so something like that and and uh, then we got tired of having other people in the house. <laughs> but it was taken over uh, to another place in this area so that they, we could keep the same number for it. And uh, yes, it's just gone on from there. I mean, it was a, a devastating thing for Bond to get the sack. And we were terribly shocked and all that. And we didn't expect it. Least from a, an organization which is supposed to be filled with compassion. 
Um, but out of that grew something which still exists today. I think that's, you know, it's a wonderful thing to have happened. Kemp was able to fulfill two roles then. Uh, the people who liked looking after people uh, stayed with Van a Friend while there was a time then for another group to become really political, submissions to royal commissions, submissions directly to Parliament and to, to parliamentarians. And uh, both streams, I suppose, continued until, what, about 1981 or something? Mm -hmm. And um, then by that time, uh, the idea of an umbrella group to help to do everything for gay men and lesbian women was was becoming a, just a little ludicrous and of course now there's lesbian and gay societies and associations and fellowships for everything you can think of just about if you want to go to church if you want to roller skate if you want to paint if you want to swim or take part in gay games or what else can you do aromatherapy is not there yet Oh, I'm, oh, I don't know about a separate thing. No, perhaps not. <laughs> what attracted you to Bonsall in the first place? Oh, dear. Um, I've thought about this quite a number of times, and I find it sort of terribly difficult to put it in words. Um, I just felt attracted to him, and my love for him just grew bigger and bigger. What was the essence of your attraction to Peter when you first met him? It was a joy to meet somebody, not only whom I could bear to look at, but somebody to whom I could talk and What do you share. mean bear to look at? Well, I thought he was rather good looking. I still do. We've both aged since then, but uh, he's wearing very well. I. Uh, found that uh, principally I was able to share things with him for a length of time that I hadn't found possible before. I still love him, but the erotic side of it uh, doesn't exist for us anymore. But uh, that doesn't seem to matter. It, um, it means that we... Uh, probably tend to seek the erotic elsewhere and um, perhaps you talk now and tell us well I suppose that I mean that part of that change is that I do have another uh, relationship with Fernando uh, and he lives in the house here and uh, um, so I guess that's one of the changes we've been able to come, uh, learn to come to terms with, to have a couple, I suppose, and a single person, if you want to describe it that way, uh, living in one house. Uh, but nevertheless, the, you know, the dependence uh, on Bonn is still there, but it is, you know, quite different to what it, what it used to be. But we have actively cultivated the idea that a, a living relationship is going to change just as one changes oneself over years uh, and we've been open for the last 34 years I think to the fact that things can and will change and um, we've uh, avoided being upset by this Oh, I'm, I'm still not sorry. I'm still glad about the first checkerboard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think it, it did so much for us, individually, um, and it seemed to uh, have repercussions that we could never then have thought of. It was, I think, just a couple of years ago when mm -hmm. we were um, taking part in the... 20th anniversary of Mardi Gras that someone who oh, must have been in their mid-40s just said I'd like to thank you two for what you did in 1972 it brings tears to the eyes that sort mm. of thing 
it's wonderful to have been involved in, in, in something which had a two-dimensional uh, influence in terms of our own lives. It made us very strong. It made us very proud about what we are. And I suppose in that respect, we've never looked back. But also, I think in terms of what it did to so-called our communities, it brought us together. It made us focus much more on what needed to be done. And I think we went forward from then on.